Um, it's my great pleasure to moderate this panel today. Um, I am going to, I'm not going to introduce our panelists uh, myself, I'm going to ask them to do that. Um, so I thought we'd start off by really asking you a little bit to, uh, to talk a little bit about what your companies do, but also more importantly I think to talk about yourselves personally. I always think these events are much more interesting if we get to know some of the people behind these companies. Um, the one thing I would say is that uh, one of the reasons I'm really excited about this panel is that everybody here has managed to, uh, in their own companies, get real scale um, and real traction in their markets. And that's something that everybody is talking about at this conference, but very few people manage to do. So these are the people with the data and with the experience and with the products that are really taking off. So for us, it's really exciting to get to know about them and their businesses. So I'm going to start with um, John. And um, tell us a bit about tiny, quick, the quickest thing about your company and then much more about you. Uh, so, uh, so I'm John Baker, uh, founder of G2L. Uh, and most people don't talk about uh, how they had a light bulb moment, but I actually had one. I remember uh, my third year of university having this idea pop into my head. And at the time, I was wrestling with uh, one key challenge, which was what's the most important problem that I could solve that would have the biggest impact in the world? And I couldn't think of anything bigger than transforming the way the world learns. Uh, and for us, uh, we build learning platforms now that support schools, universities, companies all over the world, uh, really building technology that for folks that really care deeply about student success. Uh, and it's been an incredible journey. And education is one of those fields where you don't just have an impact on the people that you're interacting with today. They go back into their communities and impact their communities. Uh, they impact uh, their companies, society at large. Uh, and really importantly, it ripples through generations. Uh, and so for me, uh, it, you know, the little thing that I like the most, it's not just necessarily the, the big scale of the millions of users, uh, it's the stories of impact at the individual level. So that's a little bit about D2L and about and Did you me. enjoy school, John? Did I enjoy yeah. school? <laughs> so I'm son of two pa uh, parents uh, that are both teachers. <laughs> uh, my grandfather was an educator as well, uh, and so, uh, I, I don't think I ever thought about it. I always just loved the competition, loved the challenge, uh, and it was an incredible journey for me. And keep in mind, I come from a very small town of about 1,000 people, moved to another town that had about 150 people, and its only claim to fame was Walt Disney's dad was from my hometown. <laughs> so uh, for me, it was education was that path to, to a better life, uh, and you know, it was an opportunity to go off there and, ex and explore uh, all these big ideas and inspirations and figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And weirdly enough, I fell back into what my parents were doing, which is really trying to improve the educational experience for millions of people. And, and I suppose my final sort of personal question, if you like, is what, well, what do your parents think of what you do now when you talk to them about the job? Oh, uh, well, my dad's a client, so that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my mom, my mom's clearly very proud, uh, you know. And for me, uh, you know, we've we've been recognized over the years with all kinds of achievements and awards and things like that. And the specialist moments that I can think back on are the ones that I share with my family, whether it's uh, my two little girls who cheer me on when I'm picking up an award, or uh, or my parents that are there to you know to recognize some of the honors that we've achieved. Uh, those are special moments. Uh, <laughs> I still remember our opening party that we had at D2L when we first started. And you know, both my grandmothers were there uh, while they're still alive. Uh, my folks were there. Uh, and it was an opportunity to really do something special uh, that was not just about building a company, uh, but really having uh, an impact in the world. So, so yeah, I'm very proud of what we've accomplished. And I'm proud that my folks have been involved along the way. Thank you. Thank you. Dan. Good. So I'm Dan Goldsmith, uh, CEO of Instructure. My father was a tax attorney, so mm. I think I think I was the only 12-year-old amongst my friends that was making you know contributions with my paper route money to a retirement account. Um, it's actually a true story, so um, that was quite fun. But but anyways, uh, you know, for me and my background, um, I've had a wide and varied set of experience. I consider myself extremely fortunate for for all the experiences that I've had uh, throughout my career. I've worked with companies large and small. I've worked with startup organizations. I've worked with organizations in just about every, every corner of the globe. So I'm a relatively new addition to Instructure joining 
uh, about a year ago, but through all of my experiences uh, throughout my career and throughout my life, there's always been the common theme and passion around people and people development and just seeing um, so much more the nonlinear paths that people, people take. And so uh, joining in structure really gave me the opportunity to extend that passion and focus. In fact, you know, my motivation is if, if I can uh, impact an individual's ability or opportunity to do something that they never thought was possible before, that's really uh, motivating and exciting for me. So at Instructure, we focus on helping people develop from their first day of school to last day of work. And so it's just a fantastic opportunity to be attached to a, a company with a fantastic mission at a great time where there's a lot of change happening, both in the educational uh, segments and the corporate segments at a global scale. Thank you. Uh, Pierre. Good morning. Um, my name is Pierre. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Open Classrooms. I started this uh, journey really a long time ago, nearly 20 years ago, when I was in middle school. I was 11 years old, and my co-founder, Mathieu, and I started a website on which we wrote and published online courses to teach web development, HTML, back in the day. Um, and we were really interested in creating websites, and we started to teach that online to some friends, and then friends of friends came in, and this is how we build an online learning community, at first in French, and at first on IT-related skills for many years in middle school, in high school, in college, for over 10 years doing so as a hobby. Uh, so it's been a long journey, and then finally, after a long time, we graduated, and this is when we really started Open Classrooms as a mission-driven company whose mission is to make education accessible, and especially professional education, so education leading to jobs, leading to a better employability, and trying to serve um, the underprivileged populations like job seekers, school dropouts, refugees, veterans. So now we, are, um, we, be, we became actually a college, a state endorsed college with degree awarding powers. So that means we publish um, and deliver associate bachelor's and master's degrees in a fully online manner with a job guarantee on two most jobs and two most skills being code, data, digital marketing, design, etc. So it's been five years as a, as a company, as an entrepreneurial, fast-growing uh, journey, um, and nearly 20 years at the end of this year uh, as uh, kind of a personal project. And uh, I should say that I sit on Pierre's board, so I know this business quite well. And he was telling me the other day that um, when he interned out of college, he interned with himself, which I'm <laughs> sure you're not supposed to do. So uh, he, he had his company and he interned it at it at the same time. Did you get yourself coffee? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much as copying all the paperwork for yourself. <laughs> Matt. So, uh, so, um, so I'm uh, a founder and CEO of Newzella. Uh, we're a content platform for K-12 schools. And, um, and what we're working on doing is replacing all the content that people don't really like, uh, a lot of textbook content, the reams of stuff that, uh, of materials that teachers have in binders under their desk, as well as this dizzying experience of searching the web for materials for their schools. We're trying to replace all of that with content that is super engaging from the best providers um, in an organized way that really works for, te for teaching and learning. Um, so when it comes to my motivation and, and who I am, I, I keep on changing the story, um, which kind of makes me sound like I'm just like doing it for whatever audience I'm, I happen to be standing in front of. The fact is that, that the reasons I started Newzell is a lot of different reasons. It was pretty complex. I've talked about the story of my son who was struggling in reading. I've talked about my experiences working in the New York State Education Department and rolling out the Common Core. But, but fundamentally, I think the theme that has guided me in life is, is uh, take dumb things that people actively dislike and make turn those into smart things that people actually like. And um, you know, I think about how I, I've lived in New York City since 1990, and for a long time I had to take cabs, and I didn't like a single experience I had of taking a cab. And then all of a sudden, Lyft came along, an Uber, um, and now I kind of like uh, taking, a, taking a cab. And, um, and technology unlocked uh, not only latent supply, 
but had people realize that, hey, it doesn't have to be this way. And, and that's certainly true with content in school. So, you know, they did it for, you know, getting the investment banker to their, to their yoga class. But, I, but I, I wanted to do it for something that I felt has an impact on something that I care incredibly deeply about and has spent, I've spent my life committed to uh, since I was a teacher in Teach for America, even before that, when I was interning for a curriculum company in high school. And that's that people don't really like the educational content. Um, and it's not just because it's dated, but it certainly is. Um, uh, students are used to a completely different way of getting content in the rest of their lives. Content comes to them, it's personalized to them, it's timely, it's engaging. Um, and then they step into, the, into schools and it's a completely different experience. And teachers, by the way, have that exact same experience. Most teachers these days are essentially born digital. Um, so it's not just about technology, it's just about getting high quality content into their hands. And um, that seems like a highly solvable problem. Um, and, uh, and not a lot of companies were really going after that, that they were, that they, they believe there was some sort of like magical pedagogical approach that they could build into software so that a student can sit in front of a computer and just consume everything they need and learn. Um, and I just fundamentally didn't believe that that was the future of education, that if you can empower teachers who are dedicated, you know, got a lot of high quality teachers out there with great, great content that, uh, that fits in with the way that we expect content to come to us uh, in the 21st century world we live in, then school's gonna be a lot better, and so we're doing it. Okay, thank you. And can we talk about some numbers, because you are all here, and I think people are really interested in the fact that you've managed to get to scale in a way that many others don't manage. So can I talk a bit about um, what numbers do you have as your sort of guiding lights of your big, you know, either, either clients or users and how you think about that? Can I start with you, John? Uh, well, in our case, we actually don't uh, necessarily talk about millions and millions of users. Uh, we tend to talk about how many users we're able to reach. And so our whole thing is around reaching every learner. So if you're blind or if you're deaf or if you're in a small community, some far flung part of the world, if you're in one of the poor slums in India, how do we actually make sure that the technology that we're building reaches every single one of those students? So, you know, to me, that's the, the big count, uh, is being able to really have an impact on uh, creating a more inclusive education system. So yeah, we have like, uh, you know, if you count licenses, we have many, many millions of licenses. Uh, but the, the big one for me has really been those stories of impact where you're actually able to connect with those students, no matter where, where they are or what difficulties they're going through. You know, great examples in Libya, which is a war-torn country, we're helping to roll out entrepreneurship education across the whole country. Started off with uh, female entrepreneurs, uh, now it's rolling out to all entrepreneurs across the country. And that's, that's not an easy environment to provide online learning, by the way. Mm. Uh, and so if we can tackle some of those challenges along the way, that's really, for us, uh, something that means a lot to our staff and to uh, the clients that we work with. And numbers, numbers Dan? Numbers. <clears throat> so, you know, how we look at the business has evolved over time. Uh, when you think of education evolving and adopting more technology in the classroom and throughout the educational experience and really digitizing uh, that experience as well, um, the, the numbers that we look at have, have evolved. So, originally it was, you know, reaching people and accessibility. Um, a lot of what we focus on now is sort of outcomes and impact. And that's not you know, looked at only in sort of mass and what is the mass population we're affecting, but each individual uh, organization, institution that we're working with, and what is the outcomes that we can drive? Can we improve uh, retention? Can we improve student success? Can we improve outcomes and graduation rates? What, is that, what does that look like? So those are some of the things that we look, like, look at on both a, a large scale as well as an individual scale. And in structure, we're focusing uh, very much on student success, in fact, uh, we recently acquired a company called Portfolio uh, that focuses on more of the longitudinal journey of an individual. Uh, I think that's going to play more and more of an important role in not just looking at the, the small windows we have into an individual's educational experience at one place or a corporate experience at one place, but how do you tie those experiences together? So as the industry has evolved and as we've evolved in partnership with the industry, we believe it's incumbent upon us to sort of inspire change, um, partnering with with our customers and driving to numbers that are, are about impact, uh, both at a student level and institution level, uh, teacher and community level. Pierre. 
you give me a number. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I know what you, it is. you know, you know, you know, all numbers. So, um, so in, in in short, we have quite of a wide range of uh, products from a MOOC type learning and up to degree programs that last for 12 months uh, with the job guarantee and also apprenticeship programs with employers to create the talent supply chain. So really to uh, make sure that students don't just have a job at the end but actually have a job from day one of the program and start studying and walking at the same time walking for four days a week and, and studying online for one day a week and after one year they'll have a college degree. So in, in terms of numbers in total we, we have a student body of three million students every month in 140 different countries um, and when it comes to the end goal for open classrooms, this is the job placement. Uh, basically, we, we track our social impact in terms of the number of students we place in the workforce, or we help create the venture of their freelancing business, or switch careers, and things like that. Um, and right now, so this is kind of another level of engagement uh, than, rather than just you know, being on an online platform and, and browsing a few online courses. Um, and right now, in terms of numbers, we, uh, we place roughly 50 to 100 folks every week uh, into new jobs um, all around the world. Um, numbers. So um, uh, unlike my colleagues, revenue is actually a really important number for us. <laughs> I I'm surprised that you don't. But, um, but in, terms of, uh, in terms of other numbers, so... Um, you can so, give us your revenue if you so, like. Uh, uh, you know, uh, let me come back to that one. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, so uh, first of all, it, it starts with the top of the funnel. So uh, we, there's a free version of Duzel and a paid version. So we look at our, uh, what's our overall impact there, what's our overall reach. Um, and Duzel is used in, uh, was used actively uh, over the past year in about 90% of all schools in the United States. Um, about half of all uh, teachers in the United States have Nuzella accounts and uh, that goes up to about three quarters when you look at our target group, which is ELA teachers, social studies teachers, science teachers, elementary school teachers. Um, so it starts with just what is our reach, um, uh, and essentially that's sort of like our brand carpet, and that's uh, and our uh, access to get them more engaged in in content. These days we're far more focused on uh, whether we're getting the content to the right user at the right time. You know, sort of like the spotification of, uh, of, of educational content that, um, you know, if you could personalize content, and I don't mean hyper-personalized, like every student has their exact particular pathway, I think that's a little bit of an overreach. But if we can get to the, the if we can start with the teachers, um, let's assume that teachers can make high quality decisions or at least know the inputs to make high quality decisions. They know what their standards are. They know what their scope and sequence is in, in school. They know their instructional strategy. We have a sense of where they are in the school year, what their content preferences are, the types of things that they teach. And if we can deliver the right content to the right time, they're going to endorse it in our own language, which means that they're going to assign it to their students. And so that hit rate on the articles that they were, the ratio of the articles that they're exposed to, to whether they actually assigned is what we're most focused on right now. And um, uh, sort of moving on from that, talking about impact, but also social mission. I mean, there's a big debate around mm -hmm. whether private companies can um, deliver the same sort of impact in a, uh, in a social uh, impact way as, as the public sector. I mean, do you feel that that is a relevant conversation for you to think about? Do you think about it in your own companies? Can at mass online learning um, have the same quality as um, offline learning? Uh, uh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, well, I was going to say no. Um, uh, or I, I just haven't seen enough evidence that, um, that you could achieve the exact same results. It may depend on certain settings and um, uh, like who the learner is, how motivated the learner is, um, exactly the subject that they're teaching. But, but fundamentally, the, there has not yet been a paradigm that trumps the social learning setting of school. Um, at the K-12 level, and again, it may be different for adult learners, it may be different in higher ed, and it may be different for highly motivated students, like, you know, who want to learn the guitar or want to learn coding on their own. 
Um, but in a K-12 setting, when we're in the United States, you're serving 50 million kids, you know, and many times that globally, um, the social learning setting is still the way that you can keep students motivated in school. So, um, and that you can diagnose them, that they could feel like there's a personal connection to each other, to the teacher, to learning in general. Um, and for that reason, we have focused on empowering the social learning setting rather than replacing it. So an, an interesting point, uh, so uh, John Smallwood, who's a Boston marathoner, he's in his 70s now, still runs the, the marathon, uh, te teaches English Lit, uh, both at the university level as well as in high school, uh, and traditional you know, uh, teacher, if you will. And he said to me one day, he said, uh, John, uh, your technology enables me to do something I could never do in the traditional classroom. Uh, I could never reach every learner in the traditional classroom. Uh, you know, I was teaching to this part of the group or this part of the class or that part of the class, but I was never able to reach every single student. Uh, and for the first time, I've been able to do that using the technology. Uh, and how he does that is gives great feedback to every one of those individual students, helps them achieve their full potential as they're going through their bigger program, helps them get to the right mastery that they need as they go on. And they go on to become great English lit, <laughs> you know, teachers at, you know, uh, uh, the University of Chicago or... Boston College or wherever they might be going. And, and to, to me, I think uh, this technology does hold a lot of promise uh, to be able to connect students, to be able to provide that uh, outreach, to be able to help them get the experiences that are gonna need to be successful in, in work and in life. So I, I, you know, I think there was a great session here before the main conference on the myths of, of uh, online learning. And I think all of them have been busted, and that's one of them, that you can't see equal results. Uh, you know, I was talking with a, a, an individual that runs a business uh, school and how his son had autism and was failing out of the traditional classrooms. Uh, went online using a, one of our clients' virtu virtual high school uh, and was able to, you know, score in the 90s and 100s in his courses and then went on to college. So I, I actually think uh, this type of technology does have the ability for us to, to reach more students and be able to be as impactful. Now, do I think the classroom is going to go away? No. I don't think that uh, mode of education is uh, going to go away. But as we try to add another 100 plus million students into the higher education system in the next 10 years, it's not all going to be brick and mortar. Uh, and so we've got to make sure we're building this technology to be able to get to that mass instruction but not leave students behind. I also think the same is true for MOOCs. Uh, so we run one of the largest MOOCs in the world. Uh, it's a MOOC on dementia. Uh, it's good, it gets about 75,000 registrations a year and cap the registration uh, with a client out of the University of Tasmania. And they, st they have uh, close to 80% of the students that start, finish. Uh, and so I, I think even these massive open online courses with the right approach, right technologies can actually make that experience a really good one, uh, especially if you have folks that are really motivated to, to complete. Uh, the, and the key is the technology has to make the experience more human. Right? It's not about you know, the technology doing something for you. It's about making that educational experience more human. So we as uh, folks that craft this type of technology have to keep that in mind as we're building it. So that was a long answer to a short question, so I appreciate the time. <laughs> Dan, I mean, you're getting to huge numbers of people, which means that in theory, at least, you can use that data to improve product to close that gap. Is that really what's happening, do you think? So, yeah, I mean, this is an interesting... Um, to mention it's not unique to instructure, unique to, to this industry. Actually, you know, having worked across a variety of industries, I've seen the evolution of cloud computing, for example, uh, over the past sort of decade plus with leading companies like Salesforce.com and others making cloud computing more mainstream. And, and in the early days, that was about sort of efficiencies of infrastructure. It eventually evolved into business agility and delivering applications or at scale and at, at speed. But the next real horizon around cloud computing that, that somewhat well recognized is these massive data sets around uh, different industries and being able to derive a tremendous amount more meaning and insights on how those industries can operate, how individuals within those industries can uh, learn and grow and change uh, the way that they engage. I mean, at Instructure, we have one of the most comprehensive databases on the educational experience on this planet. And so uh, the opportunity for us to explore and understand and derive insights from that information is tremendous. Now, we're working with, with uh, organizations, large organizations like RMIT and, and uh, the, uh, the community college system in California, OEI, which has 115 uh, schools on Canvas, 
uh, today, sort of partnering with those organizations to figure out how to utilize that information and how to ingrain that type of data into the educational experience. What's interesting is it gives you a massive opportunity, but it actually allows you to get to more of that individualization and tailoring that educational experience, enabling teachers, but you know, helping to drive student success at that individualized level. So I believe that's one of the next big horizons of evolution for us in the educational space and, and beyond. Thank you. Yeah, um, I wanted to come back to Dan's comment um, on social impact and serving also underprivileged uh, populations. I think it's quite important to, uh, um, to see that online education can definitely address that. And when I remember my college years, I've been to many lecture halls uh, with hundreds of students there, one teacher. I didn't really have uh, a personalized experience there. Mm -hmm. I, I, I did access to college life, and that was um, awesome. Um, and I was expecting, expecting a great learning experience and also great student life experience. Uh, I did enjoy the latter one, <laughs> less so the first one. Um, and I do think right now the question is more, um, is it quality education? Is it not? Is it personalized? Is it high touch? Is it flexible? Is it, is it adaptable? More than is it offline or online? Mm -hmm. I know great offline, in-person learning experience. I know also terrible ones. Um, and the question today is really how do we make sure that we can scale quality education? And of course, digital tools and technology are a great way to, to make a, a great model scale. Um, so what we use at Open Classrooms is, is based on basically competency-based education, but more so mentorship uh, as a way to have an individualized, high-touch coaching uh, access to faculty every every week. So that means students will have one-on-one -on -one mentorship session via video conference every single week for many months for at least the duration of their degree program. And it's a way to have synchronous access to industry practitioners and to keep in touch with the best practices of the industry, to have career services, career coaching, um, and to do so, of course, we need to scale. Uh, so that means we've got um, more than 1,000 mentors as part of our faculty. And with that, you can then have highly individualized learning experiences, um, and you can adapt uh, to everybody's needs when it comes to disabilities. Like you said, so we, we managed to adapt the platform for uh, visual disabilities or um, you know, uh, physical, mental, uh, or Asperger sen mm -hmm. uh, syndrome. So, you know, um, that kind of experience is, um, is very, very interesting and, and at the core of our mission at Open Classrooms. I think, and I think what Open Classrooms is doing is, is great because it, it's expanding that network and that access to resources. You know, I, I believe that students are very receptive. I think they're out in front of that receptivity to adopting technology and digital mechanisms into learning experiences. And that's influenced by uh, all the experiences they're having in, in every other portion of their lives. Um, you know, I have three daughters, uh, 15, 12, and 9, and I look at their ability to navigate and utilize technology in ways that I had never dreamed of. What's interesting is the transformation that happens with with the educators and the institutions. And it's not, as I think, John, you mentioned, it's not an either or, it's not online versus traditional. What we found is it's really more of a ma uh, multifaceted approach. Yeah. Uh, when I was visiting, there were two things that struck me when I visited um, the Orange County uh, public school system down in Florida. So, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of students uh, throughout K-12. And there were two things that struck me. One is when I was in the classroom in middle school and in high school, talking to students and talking to educators, I asked them about their experience utilizing technology. And I sort of expected to hear them talk about, well, I love this cool button and how this works, but I love how this page turns or this visualization. And there was none of that. These were, these were seventh grade students. And when I asked them about how technology and Canvas sort of affects their lives, they talked about the outcomes. They talked about how, how Canvas helps them know what they need to do. It helps them understand what to focus on. It gives them resources that help them make them successful. 
And then the teaching element was sort of fascinating. I observed this one teacher that was doing a flip classroom uh, session in his class. And then he announced to the class that that evening he was going to be holding sort of a, a Q&A off hour, office hour session online during a live sort of video-based, uh, web-based uh, session. And then shortly after that, that session would be recorded and available to everybody. So it was, it was the layering on these different facets of delivering that experience which kept the, the personalization and sort of that, that social connection with the classroom but was enabled by digital. Thank you. And look, we've got just under uh, 10 minutes left, so I wanted to change track just very briefly and talk not about scaling your businesses, but in scaling your teams and how difficult that is. I think everybody uh, recognises and probably is struggling here with growing, which is a great thing to do, but it also means that you, um, you have various cultural issues in your teams and recruitment issues. And some advice for, for the people in the audience about how you um, approach that and some of the cultural issues that you've um, faced and uh, found solutions for, I think would be really helpful. That's a long conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so as you go from uh, one person to five to 50 to 100 to 700 uh, and just keep scaling from there, it's not easy. Uh, every one of those steps is a, is a hard step. Uh, and the key is making sure that not only are you attracting the best talent, you're also developing the talent that's there within the company. Uh, so, so some of the things I'm uh, really proud of is uh, uh, five of the nine people that sit around my board table are women. Uh, five out of nine of my senior leadership team are women. Uh, and if you look at our technical team, 60% uh, of our senior leadership team within our technical teams are women. Uh, and that uh, wasn't by us saying, here's a metric we want to go off and achieve. It was by putting in place good systems that help spur that diversity within our organization around creating uh, candidate pools that were diverse, uh, making sure you're building uh, you know, a, a recruitment uh, approach that's not gonna stop by saying, hey, there's no woman that could do that. <laughs> and so we've worked very hard to make sure that uh, we're putting in place the right uh, strategies to ensure that we're building a great company. Because as we build these, uh, these technologies that support millions and millions of people, we need to make sure that the people that are building it uh, really reflect, are reflected uh, as, uh, as they are w within our client base. And so, so to me, uh, you know, that's not easy. Uh, making sure you're building a company that has built in uh, systems to support that is hard, uh, and, but it only comes from you as a leader, CEO or otherwise, uh, demanding it of the team and demanding it of the organization to, to really build the best uh, company that you can. Thank you. Dan. Yeah, so um, this is where sort of my experience, I worked with organizations that are 500,000 people, uh, global organizations. I worked with organizations as startup from zero, growing to multiple thousands of people and, and, and sort of everything uh, in between. There are different stages of a company and John, uh, as John alluded to, going from sort of zero to 50 to 100 to 700, there's different stages that you go through as, as a company as well that you need to be very mindful of. Um, I believe very deeply when, when bringing talent in, and bringing people into organization um, to, to focus on a diverse pool of individuals and, and their experiences. Um, my general philosophy throughout my career has been hiring growing teams based upon attitude and aptitude, not necessarily experience. I found over time that you invest in individuals who are sort of passionate about what they're doing and have the aptitude to learn and grow. Uh, that'll pay dividends massively over time. And it all, there's also a cultural element. Um, there's a time as you get bigger as a company where um, in the early stages maybe the CEO or the leadership team can sort of sort of set and steer the culture of the company. But I think some of the best companies out there have more of an organic culture, a culture of the people uh, that grows. And I think culture is probably one of the most uh, important factors to, to people joining an organization today. It comes up in every single interview I have and every dialogue I have with, with our employees across the globe. Um, I also think it's important to sort of look in uh, um, you know, unusual locations. Being technology companies, uh, organizations tend to think of Silicon Valley or some of the traditional technology centers. We found some amazing talents in some cities that are not traditionally known for technology, whether it be Philadelphia, which is my hometown, um, or in Chicago, or we have a, a large uh, team in Budapest today, Sydney, uh, in South America, and across Asia. So having that global talent, I think, has sort of elevated our culture and thus in turn created a lot of opportunities for, for a number of individuals to join the company. Um, just one last point on this in terms of scale. 
Um, what a lot of companies lose as you grow and try to establish scale is the, the, um, the resistance to listening. I think this is probably one of the most important things. I spend a good amount of my time um, with our employee base and out in the field and listening uh, to customers. And that's something, regardless of the size of our organization, I never want to lose. It takes more and more effort, but I think all of us could probably agree that just listening to your employees and being uh, yeah. out there is hugely helpful in the growth. Okay. We worked a lot on uh, defining the mission, the vision, the principles of the company, the mission being to make education accessible, uh, the principles like we care, we dare, we tell it as it is, we persist. Um, and one of the things that helped us uh, scale in terms of the organization uh, I'm most proud of is probably the fact that we created um, um, a, a course on the culture of open classrooms. So it's basically a course on openclassrooms.com that's called How Do We Work at Open Classrooms that explain in great details the mission, the vision, the organization. Uh, it's really comprehensive um, and we use it during the recruiting process. Um, and you can probably guess that you know when candidates don't even go there, maybe they don't are uh, so much interested in your company, but uh, sometimes that completed this eight hour long course uh, for the first interview can have a better sense of the commitment behind um, this, can, um, this application. And then when they hire, they go through an onboarding process, which is actually um, kind of a small degree program on a, on a whole with mentorship. Uh, so again, mentorship would be internal, so you'd have a more experienced employee from Open Classrooms to mentor you every week. You'll have projects to complete within the company to, uh, you have an idea and you want to experiment something, okay, so you have this project and, and you have to run kind of a transversal uh, new project within Open Classrooms. You have courses to know how to um, behave, let's say, uh, and also to work efficiently as a team to uh, speak efficiently uh, in a public environment, et cetera, et cetera. And it is actually pretty long because um, we committed to um, make every new employee be, uh, use one day a week uh, for the first three months and then one day every two weeks for the next three months uh, for this onboarding um, program. And obviously it's also interesting because they use our own platform and our own pedagogy and, and framework. Uh, so it's been really a great success. It's probably one of the things that we're most proud of when it comes to hiring and scaling uh, the culture of open classrooms. Thanks, Pierre. You've got two minutes. Sure. So, <laughs> it, so uh, the um, cultural norms is something that I talk about a lot with our, our chief people officer, our head of HR. Um, I'm increasingly of the mindset that cultural norms are uh, are a place that a lot of biases hide behind. And where that shows up is, so you have a job description, there's a discrete set of skills that, uh, that you want the, the candidate to, to prove that they have. Um, you want evidence of that. So you engage in an evidence-based interview. Show me what you've done throughout your career that shows me that you have these skills at an extremely high level, you know, in our case like a top five, per, 10 percent, top five percentile level. Um, and then you throw in all these cultural norms and you bring in these people to do cultural interviews. And it, you end up getting statements like, well, you know, they didn't look at me in a certain way or I didn't like their level of confidence as they spoke about this. And I always ask the same questions of people when they come back with these comments. I say, well, is that in the job description? If the answer is no, then erase that from your mind and focus on the, the job attributes. Hiring good people is hard enough without throwing in all of these little barriers in your mind as to what the right person looks like, whether it's from her personality, extrovert, introvert, um, sort of how they express a biased action, like all of these things, or the color of their skin, or their gender, or the, um, uh, like all of these things creep into the process. And it makes it really hard to hire good people if you are not vigilant about excluding those attributes that are not on the JD. So when it comes to, when it comes to cultural norms, what I really encourage our, our head of HR to say is there's really just one, which is that you care about our mission. Um, we are 
unwavering about that. You must be here because you care deeply about making an impact on education and you're excited about the way that we're gonna do it. Um, and other than that, your job is to get your job done. Perfect, thank you. Look, three seconds to go, we're good. <laughs> thank you very much for everybody. It was really interesting. Thank, thank you, you, Louise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.